morning. <laughs> um, as Adam alluded to, this is kind of a convergence of uh, a lot of different things. And uh, I think if you look back on your spiritual journey and you look back on how God works, uh, I think if you're attuned enough to what he's doing, I think you'll see that there's multiple threads of things coming together. And even with this message, um, you know, we're doing this series called Soul Care, where uh, we're examining all the different things that uh, occur inside and uh, especially emotionally that affect things further on the outside. Um, and so if you think of like an iceberg, um, you see only 10% of it. And so that was kind of the illustration that, that Adam used in the weeks that he spoke. Um, and so one of the first things that we talk about in the, in the principles of the book that we're um, kind of basing this on is that you have to look beneath the surface because there's so much underneath. Um, and as we looked at that, we, we focused on uh, seven desires. There are seven desires that all of us have. Um, we've gone through six of them, and I'm doing the last one. And we actually changed the order. And, you know, I talked about convergence. Uh, and the last one of these is, is touched. And it's really appropriate that it's occurring today because this is the first uh, Sunday of Advent uh, as we're kind of preparing for what what it meant that Jesus came to earth. Uh, it's also uh, a day that we, we're going to have communion after the, the message. Uh, and so there's this real sense of what it meant for Jesus to actually come to earth, to physically walk among us. Um, and so just keep that in mind as we go through the scripture. Um, I wanted to share the story. I, I was listening to uh, an episode of This American Life, and one of the things they were talking about is this couple that was dealing with uh, a parent that was wrestling through um, dementia. And, and so sometimes she would just go off the rails and just start talking about weird things that they just didn't know what to do. And, you know, the, the daughter, who was, you know, her, her um, blood relation, she, she kept insisting, like, oh, no, that's not true. And she kept trying to steer her in the correct direction. Um, and she would resist because she was stuck in these these moments that were disconnected from the current reality. Um, but both of them had actually had training in improv. And one of the things that I, I haven't done improv and speaking in front of people, this is not my normal thing, as Adam said. Um, but one of the things I guess they do in improv is as you kind of interact with people, you don't just kind of dismiss what they've done. They, whatever they put on there, put out there, as outlandish as it might be, is you, you enter into the reality that they kind of establish. And so the, the son-in-law started doing this where the, the mom would be talking about monkeys, the monkeys are getting away. And he would be like, well, there's so many of them. Like, and he would just kind of enter that reality. And at some point she would realize, oh, you know what, this is kind of silly. And then she would kind of laugh along and and it really built up their relationship. And as I thought about this, this, this is something that I've experienced myself uh, in teaching kids, as I've done for, I think it's like 25 years I've done it. <laughs> so it's been a while. Um, one of the things that the, the kids would love to do is as they walk in, they would grab uh, a, a Lego piece, and each of them would decide uh, what that color would um, what, what kind of property the color would give that piece of Lego. So, for instance, if they grabbed a blue Lego, they'd hand it to me like, it's cold, it's ice, and I'd pretend like it's cold. Uh, or they'd hand me a red one, and it would be a hot Lego, and so I would, I would juggle it around. And I kid you not, this is every week, <laughs> every time they saw me, they would never tire of this. And there's something to this idea of entering someone's reality. And that's, that's what Jesus did. That, that really speaks to something deep within us that uh, not only uh, affirms us, but also kind of lets us know that you are with that person. And you know, we talked about uh, Christmas earlier, um, and we talk about presents, but um, this is something I, I can't remember where I heard it, but um, it's, it's good to focus not just on the presence, but being present with people uh, during this time. 
And that, that point, again, points all back to the incarnation, but it actually points to something even before that, because if you think back to Genesis, when, when God created man, one of the things he did was he put his hands into the dirt, and he got the dirt in his fingernails, and he, he formed it together, and then he breathed his words into the, the man, and the man came to life. Um, and so from creation all the way through, Jesus came to earth, and when he was resurrected, um, this is something that I think we overlook all too often, is Jesus was resurrected physically. It was not just, oh, you know, the spirit of Jesus was still alive, but he actually appears among his disciples. He walks along some of them, and his mere presence walking alongside of them, they think back on it, and they're like, didn't it feel like there was some fire burning in us when he was with us? And then he appears to his disciples who are scared for their lives. And Thomas, who's kind of skeptical, he actually feels the wounds that are still there, right? And then to top it off, Jesus eats something to show them, hey, I'm, I, I could eat. I'm, I'm actually physically here. And that's the reality for us, too. It's not just this, oh, well, when I get to heaven, everything will be fixed and we'll be all good. But our actual physical bodies will be resurrected. And so in this framework, I want to talk about this last um, desire that we have, which is touch. Um, Sorry, I'm a little behind here. (laughs) So just to recap, the the desires that we covered previously is we have a desire to be heard. Uh Uh-oh. I don't know why it's not. Oh, there we go. We have a desire to be affirmed by God. We have a desire to be blessed. We need to be assured that we're safe. And also, um, Adam talked about being chosen, what it means to be chosen, and then what what it means to be included. And today, we're going to talk about uh, that deep desire to be touched, which again is, is framed in, in this notion of being created beings, but also in um, having a resurrected Christ, a physically resurrected Christ. Um, one of the things that I want to also kind of tell you guys about before we get into the, the passage is also that uh, God instructed his people on very specific rules about what not to touch, too. Um, and so two of the things I'm going to focus on, uh, I'll talk about in a little bit. As I mentioned, there were a lot of rules about not touching things in, in Scripture. And uh, two of the ones that pertain to our passage are found in Leviticus 15, 19 to 33, and Numbers 19, 11 to 22, uh, which I just put out there in case you want to look into all the details. Um, because there's a lot of very specific points about if this happens, then don't do this and, you know, keep it separate for seven days. Don't touch this. If someone sits on this, you know. And, but one of the things that uh, um, reading this I found out was, uh, so the first passage pertains to when a woman has a bleeding discharge, you need a certain uh, period of time for her to, to, to be clean, for you to be able to touch her. And then the other one is about handling dead bodies. And there are of course, very symbolic reasons for this. But when, especially when you read the one about the dead bodies, you realize God was also concerned with microbes and he couldn't explain it to his people. But if you read it, it talks about how if anyone's inside the tent, when someone dies, if there's any vessel that's not covered, um, those things are considered unclean. And so it's not just purely a, a, a spiritual metaphor. It, it is something that is of physical concern, even at the microscopic level. And so that's the attention to detail that God has. Um, so you could, you could uh, look at those things. Well, so if there are so many things that we don't touch, when is it right to touch? And, you know, it, there's been a lot of stuff in the news about what happens when people are touched at inappropriate times. And, you know, I, I think we've read about it over and over, and we're constantly deflated. And I think to the point where we're kind of, so, like, relieved when someone isn't accused of something, right? Um, and so this is the climate. But um, keeping all this in mind, we're going to read from uh, Mark 
chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. And I'll be reading from the, the English Standard Version. Actually, before I do read that, let me just frame what's been going on uh, in Mark before that. Jesus had just found his disciples, and he's going through a little bit of a training period with them. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had any sort of training in different things, but as you train, you get what's known as like a muscle memory, or you, you get familiar with something, and it doesn't, it's not as scary when you face, face it. Uh, one of the ways I learned this uh, growing up in, in Chicago is we would have driver's ed, and one of the things they would teach us is skid recovery because it gets snowy and icy. And the way they would do this is they'd take this old driver's ed car and then cover, uh, put it out on the pavement that's covered with water. And they'd set out these cones. And while you're driving, the instructor would grab your wheel and, and hit his brake, sending you in a spin, and you're instructed to, sit, uh, to avoid hitting the cones because you're imagining those are people. You've got to figure out a way to not hit the cones. Um, of course, we actually, I don't think any of us ever avoided the coins, cones, <laughs> but, but it really helped to experience that, like actually physically experience that because when I did face skids, it, it wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed by the shock of like, oh, what do I do in this panic? And so this is kind of the same thing that Jesus is going through with his disciples right now. He's kind of walking them through, like, these are the different things that you're going to be doing once I send you out. Uh, he sends, sends them out a little bit later in, in, in the book. But he's giving them a, a taste of different things so that they're prepared uh, for what's ahead. Uh,